by Alex and we are the two soldiers who will be loading and firing this cannon for you all here today. Uh, before we get into the fun stuff of actually making the cannon go boom, uh, I thought it wise to talk about uh, what we're wearing, uh, the fort itself, and what a cannon like this would be doing here in the 1880s. So first and foremost, we are dressed as soldiers of the 23rd Infantry Regiment. Companies E and K were stationed here at Fort Mackinac from 1884 until 1890. And they had a pretty unique purpose, as at that time, Fort Mackinac was the headquarters of what was then Mackinac Island National Park, which was the second national park in the country. And the soldiers, they had to be taking care of that park. They were the park rangers of their day. So they would be actually going out, patrolling it, maintaining it, as well as enforcing all the various rules and regulations. Uh, but they were still soldiers, and that was their primary job. So they would still have uh, guard duty on a regular basis, drill duty, fatigue duty, um, going out onto the rifle ranges and practicing marksmanship. Uh, additionally, they also had to entertain tourists, as even back in the 1880s, tourism was the predominant industry here on Mackinac Island. Uh, and a couple of times per week, uh, the army would actually invite tourists into the fort to watch them perform some of their daily ceremonies, one of which was uh, the firing off of cannons in what are known as salute shots. Now, salute shots are just a black powder charge, no cannonball in sign, it's just to make a loud bang to celebrate something. Think of this as just a really large, oversized party popper. So uh, the army would be firing these off for basically any excuse they could think of. So uh, the raising of the flag in the morning, they'd fire a cannon off. Uh, the lowering of it in the evening, again a cannon. Uh, on the 4th of July, they'd fire off one shot for every state of the Union, so that'd be going on for quite a while. Um, they'd fire it off for Decoration Day, which is what we know as Memorial Day now. Uh, additionally, uh, in more grievous circumstances, they'd fire off cannons, uh, such as uh, when President Grant died in 1885, um, the soldiers fired off cannons to honor him. Uh, or, on more joyous cir circumstances, uh, like when the first steamboat of tourists uh, would come to the island after a particularly long winter, they'd fire off a cannon to greet them. Uh, and the cannons they'd be using is very similar to what we have for you all here today. This being our Model 1841 six-pound smoothbore field gun. That being a rather mouthful, uh, the soldiers, and thus us, just call it uh, a six-pounder. Um, but I guarantee you all, that name does not refer to the cannon's weight, uh, but it refers to something else. It's a specific object. Would anyone like to guess as to what that might be? Shout it out. The cannonball. Cannonball! Yes, the cannonball. This gun could fire a six-pound cannonball uh, with about a, a pound and a quarter of powder behind it, and it could launch that ball about a mile or so. So if you imagine from wow. here, could go all the way out to the shores of Round Island over there. But if you remember the long technical name I gave, uh, I said smoothbore, uh, meaning that there's no rifling or machined grooves carved into the barrel to give the cannonball any sort of spin, so the ball just bounces around a little bit and the last way it bounces is kind of where it goes. So the smallest target I can guarantee with absolute certainty that we could hit from a mile is about the size of Round Island out there. <laughs> Not a very accurate cannon. Um, it's a bit better at a half mile, so if you imagine uh, just about to the end of the stone break wall out there, from that distance, uh, we can reliably hit a ship-sized target once out of every three shots. Granted that it's stationary, of course. Uh, but despite all of its inaccuracy, this cannon was quite revolutionary when it was developed in the 1840s. Uh, if you notice the long tongue in this, as well as the chains, uh, this cannon being relatively light as far as cannons go, the barrel is only about 880 pounds. Um, this was meant to be moved around battlefields with great speed, so they would attach a team of horses uh, and this cannon could uh, fly uh, across the battlefield at unprecedented uh, speeds um, to be able to meet the needs of the day as it progressed. Uh, cannons could no longer be stationary devices as they had been in prior wars. Um, so they would use this pretty uh, frequently in the uh, Mexican-American War from 1846 to 48. Um, these guns saw a little bit of service in the American Civil War, primar primarily on the side of the Confederacy, as even by then these guns were starting to become outdated. Um, but by the 1880s, this is a 40-year-old relic. There is no reason to use this on a battlefield. Uh, the U.S. Army had developed artillery that was rifled instead of uh, smoothbore. It would be loaded from the breech, the back, instead of from the muzzle. Uh, and it used, a, it used modern shells instead of cannonballs, and it could fire those shells pretty accurately up to five miles away. So this old Civil War surplus gun really has 
uh, no purpose on a battlefield. And that's why it would be sent up to places like Fort Mackinac to serve in a ceremonial role as this, is, this was just the headquarters of a national park. They didn't need any modern artillery. That would be reserved uh, for more important posts out west. Uh, with that all being said, I figured, in honor of you all coming here today, we might as well fire this cannon off for you all. How does that sound? Yeah. Yeah. That's a decent amount of enthusiasm. We can make it work. All right. So before we actually fire this cannon, we have to go through a couple of safety steps. Uh, so first what I'm going to do is take this leather glove here and cover up the vent or touch hole. This is to make sure that um, no oxygen gets in to stoke up any embers that could be remaining from our previous shot. Alex, in the wild, is going to use the auger or gunner's worm. He's going to send that down the barrel to fish out any of that debris. Um, if he does find anything today, it will be some historically inaccurate aluminum foil. Of course, in the 1880s, they used what was known as muslin cloth, which is uh, sort of a canvas bag type material. Um, but that has a tendency to smolder and burn, and we, of course, don't want to fire out any flaming debris to uh, light either a lilac bush or a tourist on fire. Um, anyways, now he's going to use the wet swab. This is just a damp piece of sheep's wool on the end of a stick. He's going to run that down the barrel to extinguish any possible embers that could still be in the cannon, again, from our previous shot. But now that he has done that, uh, it is safe to load in our actual cannon charge. The charge, of course, is very similar to what they would have used in the 1880s, although, as I've already mentioned, they're wrapped in aluminum foil instead of, inside of a cloth bag. Uh, but they're inserted and loaded the same way, so from the muzzle, uh, Alex is going to use the rammer on the other end of a wet swab, run it all the way down to the breech end of the cannon, tap it in, and now we are ready to wheel it up as the cannon is officially loaded. Now he has to prime the piece. So this is two simple steps. One is to take this brass spike called the gimlet and run it down the vent. That's going to pierce a hole in the charge itself, which will reveal some of the black powder inside, uh, making way for our ignition device. And the ignition device we are using is the same type of device they would have used uh, back in the 1880s and even way back into the 1840s. Uh, it's called a friction primer. Uh, it's essentially a small brass tube filled with gunpowder, uh, and at the top there is a pin running through a chemical called fulminate of mercury, which is very susceptible to friction. So when that pin is pulled, that amount of friction is enough to spark the mercury, which will then ignite the powder in the tube, shooting a jet of flame into the uh, charge itself, setting it off. Uh, with that being said, um, it's at this time I will remind you all, this is a cannon. You might find it rather loud. While most of the sound will be going out into the harbor, I encourage you all to either cover your ears or get your cameras ready, wherever your priorities may be in life. That being said, there are only two commands left to give to fire off the piece. They are... Ready! Fire! And there you go. After the army walking to, or sorry, yeah, it is. After the, after the army walking tour, that's going to be just in front of the guardhouse taking place at the three.